Hello everyone and welcome to the virtual Kings Fund for what I believe is the first all remote Kings Fund event. My name is Matt Honeyman um, and I lead, work and speak for the fund on the use of digital technology in the health and care system. Among other things, I've done research on the people and projects building clinical AI tools in radiology and in other specialties. Today we're going to discuss the role that AI can play in solving some of the health system's biggest long-term challenges, um, workforce gaps, vacancies and projected um, demand that far outstrips um, supply, um, which is a common story across all clinical specialties. And radiology is no exception. Um, but the promising progress made over the last eight years applying deep learning and other techniques to image data um, meant that there's quite a lot of optimism around um, the potential in radiology, um, depending as it does heavily on the interpretation of images. Um, uh, lots of predictions of automating radiologists out of a job, um, but I think last year's top all re review um, talked a bit more realistically about um, the hopes that um, technologies like AI can give clinicians the gift of time, um, something far more realistic, in a, but a still a stretching goal um, for the technologists and the clinicians working with them to, to build these tools to embed in clinical workflows. So now for those of us who sit outside the radiology and AI communities, it might still feel like this is a bit all hypothetical. Um, it's a future that keeps being promised um, uh, around the deployment and some of the hype around AI. But my understanding is a lot of progress has been made and it's crunch time. Products are in development that will soon move to prospective trials. Um, uh, and the original wave of investment in radio radiology AI research um, is paused as in, it's slightly paused as investors await new evidence about the impact on real world outcomes. Um, we have three excellent clinical experts to discuss these issues and delve into them in more detail. Um, uh, and uh, the kind support of IBM Watson Health, our event sponsor, who, has, uh, who we thank for enabling all of this to go ahead. Before I bring in our speakers, let me talk about how the session will work. We've been collecting questions from our audience about radiology and AI, um, and we'll be answering those throughout the broadcast and putting them to our panel. Um, but this event is pre-recorded. Um, you can still raise those questions during the live broadcast, however, when this goes out um, on the 23rd of April by going to Slido and putting the code KF online in. And we'll work with our information and knowledge service, um, our experts um, uh, that we have contact with, um, to answer some of these questions in the days following the live broadcast. Um, finally, I'd recommend that you look at the resources tab to the right of this recording um, to access uh, further information and uh, about, the, about the, the session. Now, I'm going to introduce our three speakers, and then we'll turn to each so they can explain their work in this area and opening, give us some opening reflections in a little bit more detail. First is Dr. Mark Davis, who's the Chief, Chief Medical Officer at IBM and IBM Watson Health. We're also joined by Dr. Neelam Dugar, a consultant radiologist at Doncaster and Bassett Law Teaching Hospitals. Um, he's an informatics advisor and chair of the Radiology Informatics Committee at the Royal College of Radiologists. And finally, Professor Erica Denton, who's Medical Director and Honorary Professor of Radiology at Norfolk and Norwich University Hospital. He's also a National Advisor for Imaging at NHS Improvement. Now, um, if I could turn to Mark first, please, introduce you yourself to um, our viewers, please. Uh, as you say, I'm, I'm Mark Davis. Uh, I'm a clinician by background and work as the Chief Medical Officer for both Watson Health and IBM across Europe, the Middle East uh, and Africa. The approach that IBM takes to the subjects of healthcare um, is that uh, it is a belief that actually most other industries have benefited enormously from this, in, this technology, whether that be uh, the journey to cloud, whether that be the effective use of data uh, and using the insights that derive that data or indeed artificial intelligence. And they've, the benefits that they've had from these uh, approaches have been both in terms of improved productivity uh, and improved consistency and therefore quality in the delivery of services. Um, our belief is, is frankly that healthcare is too important to be the last industry to take advantage of, of this technology. Um, we believe that uh, artificial intelligence and the application of effective insights can make care more consistent, safer, more cost effective and frankly more, more personal. That's true of um, health care more broadly, and it's certainly true of imaging uh, uh, and radiology. 
Um, we're going to get into the detail uh, uh, as we can, the conversation continues around some of the specific work that we're doing in, uh, in imaging. But basically, it's built out of the premise that if we take machines, what machines do really well, and we take what clinicians do really well, and we bring those things together, we end up in a better place. Um, in many ways, playing to the strengths of clinicians and playing to the strengths of of machines that do artificial intelligence will achieve in a much quicker and, 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 and more effective way those two aims of driving productivity and driving improvements in, in, in quality. Um, it's for that reason uh, that this area of medicine in particular is is um, uh, it's such an important focus for us in IBM and frankly uh, is very exciting. Thank you very much, Mark. Neelam. Hi, I'm Neelam Dugger. I'm a consultant radiologist at Doncaster and Bassett Law Teaching Hospitals. Um, it's a busy DGH. Uh, I, I'm a jobbing radiologist. And, and as a hobby, I, I kind of do informatics. Um, I, I believe in technology. I know that technology can transform our lives. And I've, I've uh, taken on the role of the, uh, of the informatics advisor at the Royal College of Radiologists to help other radiologists uh, adopt technology without fear. And, um, it, it's, and I also chair the uh, Radiology Informatics Committee at the Royal College of Radiologists. Brilliant. It sounds like a very fun view to have for um, Neelam. And finally, I'd like to hand over to uh, uh, Professor Eric Zenton um, to introduce yourself and your work, please. Thank you very much. I'm Eric Denton. I'm um, less often a jobbing radiologist, certainly, than my colleague Neelam. Um, I have predominantly managerial and advisory roles, but I still do a little clinical radiology. And I see a huge advantage in artificial intelligence in assisting us to do the jobs that we all do well, better than we do currently, and to enable us to transform some of our services. And I think artificial intelligence, alongside many other technological transformative solutions, are going to be vital for the next few years of healthcare development. And particularly, it's a time that we're working so hard in the NHS with stretched resources. Embracing technologies such as AI has to be fundamental to what we all do. That's great. Thank you very much, guys. I think just picking up on some of the remarks that you guys were making in your um, introductions there, um, I'm interested in kind of teasing out some of the examples um, of these kinds of technology that we might have and where they, like, what does the role of an a, a radiologist involve day to day um, and where we really think that, that these kinds of technologies might be able to help. Is it a case that it's just one kind of, um, one kind of task that you do on a, on a daily basis or is it something that can help a, a, across the piece? Um, Erica, just because you, you, you kind of um, talked about, about that most directly, would I be able to go to you first, please? Of course. So I think there's lots of hidden ways in the um, artificial intelligence already helping. So most CT scanners and MRI scanners have large amounts of AI embedded in what they do now and could have much more. And a modern CT scanner, for instance, images are optimized using artificial intelligence. The way that I see it impacting on the day-to-day -day lives of radiologists is often as a first read or a screening of multiple sets of images. So for instance, artificial intelligence can tell if there is fresh blood on brain scans, brain CT scans, and can then stratify a whole cohort of scans to show the radiologist which ones to report first because they might have fresh blood evident on them. There's really good evidence that AI can screen for fractures on plain x-rays. So there are lots of examples where it can assist the radiologist and give the radiologist better use of their own time. I think one of the examples for particularly oncological imaging experts is we're often asked to look and see if there's been a change since a previous set of images. And artificial intelligence can tell that quickly and can show a radiologist which bits of a study to look at first. And I think these are going to be really important over the coming years. One mustn't forget, however, that radiologists are also doctors who see patients face to face. 
and AI can't replace an ultrasound scan or a biopsy or the ability for an interventional radiologist to stem bleeding or unblock a blocked vessel. All these things require hands-on, face-to-face interaction. And those are the things that take much longer time in many examples than reporting, say, a plain film or two. So it won't replace radiologists, but I do think this will be technology that augments what we do in every day of our working lives. Just to very quickly um, come back, is there, when you talk about the kind of evidence that's out there, can you just give us a sense of of what form that evidence takes? Is it evaluations of, a say, an, an, an algorithm in a, in a kind of... Um, or analogous to a laboratory environment or is this kind of real world evidence where these are being deployed already? So there's real world evidence for some of these algorithms and for some of them it's really robust involving hundreds of thousands of studies being tested using a particular algorithm. For others it's emerging evidence. So what we need to do now is to collaborate as an imaging community with those who Uh, create these algorithms and test them across systems so we can work out what's most useful for the NHS. Thanks very much. Neelam, um, I'm interested in your reflections as a a jobbing radiologist um, as as well. So um, if you would like to come in, please do. Uh, uh, Thank you very much, Matt. Um, uh, I'm going to kind of repeat what uh, Erica's more or less said because she summarized it really, really well. Yes, it is going to. Uh, so if you look at what a radiologist does with with just taking one subset, not the ultrasounds, not the procedures that we do, the reporting element, which will be hugely uh, changed and transformed by AI. We do the reporting, i.e. look at images and give an opinion, which is radiolo- radiological opinion. And uh, if as part of the uh, of the radiologist report we it is about uh, detection finding what uh, what's uh, if there is something that is not quite right then is the interpretation of saying um, what uh, uh, providing a tentative or differential diagnosis and then the advice of for the next step of management now for the detection part i think we are heading towards where ai will do a lot of the detection and then coming down to the tentative or differential diagnosis, the trouble with medicine, that medicine isn't maths, and it often real, re- requires a lot of thought process into how to come up with the tentative or differential diagnosis. And therefore, what we come out with is a, a, is a personalized medicine, which is what the radiologist often provides, is uh, the tentative and differential diagnosis and advice on the next step of management. Because what looks like, I often say this to when I teach the ENT doctors is that I cannot tell you whether something by just looking at an image whether something is benign or malignant often that requires histology because a lymph node that is enlarged can be an inflammatory node and can be a malignant node so There are limitations with whatever we do, but somebody needs to be held responsible to a patient when things go wrong, and that needs to be a human being. And therefore, we will take on the role of actually using judgments and opinions and giving a tentative or differential diagnosis and advice on the next step. What AI will do will be the detection. The AI, the computer vision is better than the human vision. The um, computer vision d- does not tire out like the human vision. So it is us working collaboratively, co- collaboratively with the computer and enhancing healthcare. Thanks very much. Um, Mark, I'd like to give you an opportunity to come in as a, uh, a fellow clinician by background. Um, how's this going to feel and how does it already feel as some of these solutions reach um, frontline conditions? The way I often think of it, from an imaging perspective is in in four broad areas. Um, There is real value to be derived um, in the first area, which is is before uh, the patient uh, is actually offered imaging. The second area is during the imaging process itself, potentially picking up changes in imaging or or, or the whole area of interventional radiology. Uh, and the third area is after the, the imaging and the reporting has, has been done. 
But the fourth area we shouldn't forget, and Erica touched on this a, a little bit, and that is that, that AI is already being embedded in, in, in much of the equipment that we use um, today, um, and, and there are lots of potential for the non-clinical processes that make up such an important part of our diagnostic workflows and the experience that our patients actually receive, such as administration, the booking, and those underlying flow processes. Um, uh, being significantly uh, augmented using um, using machine learning. So in the UK, Watson Health has started this journey uh, in the box that I described as the box after uh, the imaging. We have a product that we're currently evaluating called Clinical Review, which in essence looks for and, and, and captures discrepancies between an image as read by a computer vision and a radiologist's report. And as such, uh, acts as a check to pick up missed uh, or indeed incidental findings that aren't reported uh, 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 by a radiologist. Now that's where we've started this journey, but actually all four of those areas that I've described are a really important and rich area of uh, innovation uh, in imaging. That's those are really um, fascinating opening reflections and, and a kind of clear insight into your into your working lives as well. So thank you very much for those. I think, Mark, you actually touched on one of the questions that um, we'd collected beforehand from um, our audience about whether the technology can take away some of those routine tasks. And I mean, this question has words ensure that radiologists work can be focused on the things that AI can't do. Um, for example, speaking to patients. Um, though I've seen examples of, uh, I, th I think, uh, uh, Google have, have a product that is uh, uh, being rolled out in the UK, which um, uh, phones up businesses and um, uh, is, is a, a, an artificial intelligence tool that um, verbalizes text and asks those businesses when their opening hours are, um, but uh, uh, flags up that, they, that it's a, a piece of technology and there's not actually a human on the other end of the line. So maybe in the one day, um, radiologists might be able to uh, might be able to hand, hand over the, some of those tasks about speaking to patients. The question is whether they would want to, of course. So um, I think uh, 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 that's that's probably not something they would like to um, give up in, in, in the end. Um, so I think one of the uh, areas that we'd like to turn the discussion to first is um, in research and development. So um, some of the questions that have come in cover this area in, um, uh, in a couple of different ways. I might summarise them and how we can, the, the questions to you guys is, uh, how can we support the research and development that's going on? Some of the things that Mark has just described going on at IBM Watson Health, um, some of the things going on elsewhere. Um, and really ensure a, a fair deal for the, for the staff and patients upon whose data and collaboration um, this kind of R&D depends. Um, Neelam, would you like to go first, um, as I think you're next in our, our rotation system? So the research and development side, I, I think it's like AI is like any other test. We've had a lot of discussions around COVID. So sorry, I'm going to bring this up. And we have all become experts on how the sensitivity and specificity of these antibody tests versus the PCR tests. AI is no different. We need to make sure that it's a, sen it's a sensitive uh, test so that when it detects an abnormality, it detects if, if sensitivity, you know, its sensitivity is high enough to be considered to be reliable and how what is its specificity. So that really is down to the researchers. The radiologists working in research will get involved in this to make sure that, and when it comes out, there is good regulation to make sure that uh, poor quality AI is not hitting the NHS and therefore causing more damage. So whatever comes in, we need to have good uh, regulation. We need to have good researchers and we need to make sure that whatever comes and becomes available to the frontline doctors like me has been uh, has been tested uh, adequately and is reliable before it's put into clinical practice. But I, I don't think that is far away, really. OK, th uh, thanks very much, Neelam. I think um, I was going to turn to Mark then, Erica. Um, Mark, what kind of uh, collaboration, you know, does does do you, um, partners like IBM Watson Health require from from the health service for this kind of? It's really important. The reality is that 
collaboration, particularly between industry, academic institutions and policymakers, is absolutely the sweet spot, spot that will allow us to innovate at a level where we get the kind of mature evaluation that Neelan has been has been describing, but also that we're able to scale and deploy these solutions at a level that makes sense for a whole healthcare system. Um, I was, look, I was really pleased to hear Neelam say that we should be treating this in the same way as we treat any other clinical uh, intervention, and I completely agree with that. Um, our, our own approach to evaluation in Watson Health is, 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 is broadly on three levels. The first thing uh, is to evaluate uh, and build the evidence around the technology itself. So does the technology actually work as a standalone uh, offering? The second is critically an evaluation uh, and the building of the evidence around the workflow. So if you implement the technology in a real world setting, um, potentially with multiple imaging vendors, different systems, different professionals, different workflows, uh, et cetera, um, uh, is it implementable in the kind of way where you derive the same the same benefits uh, and leads to acceptance by those who, who, who have to use it. And the third, and in many ways, the most important is around outcomes. So are we achieving improved outcomes, uh, more consistent, uh, uh, high quality care that is safer and better for patients? Um, and, and it's those, those three tiers that we look at um, in the evaluation of, of, of AI and uh, in Watson Health, we call it leading with, leading with science. Um, uh, and it's a really important principle, I think, about how we, um, how we test and how we make the case uh, in an incremental way for, um, for artificial intelligence in healthcare. But there is an inherent warning in what I've just said. Uh, and that, that warning is um, to guard against looking at uh, some early research that's done perhaps um, uh, uh, that just ticks the first of those boxes, perhaps really nicely, but then the danger is to, to extrapolate and overinterpret the results uh, into the other two, two areas. We need to be really careful of this and we need to step through those three layers in a mature, peer-reviewed, scientific way to incrementally build the evidence that's so important uh, for both professional and public confidence. So setting a high bar there. Erica, can I turn to you and, and, and also kind of pose an additional question, which is, I guess I asked Mark what industry needed from the uh, health system. What about the other way? What does the health system need from industry in terms of um, this kind of work? So, I, I, yeah, I think if you switch that question around and say, so what does the health system need? Well, we need agile partners in industry who understand things from a clinical perspective. So there have been some AI offerings which are beautiful algorithms that do fantastic things, but are just not really clinically relevant or are relevant for one particular tiny niche in healthcare. And I think where it'll be easier for radiology departments to embrace AI technology is to have a suite of algorithms under one umbrella so that you wouldn't have to plug and play with many, many different providers, which I think radiology is going to find really difficult. I would absolutely endorse what both Neelam and Mark have said. We really do need regulated tested products here we and we need them to be available in the systems that we use every day so you can go to lots of conferences at the moment and lots and see lots of ai providers showing beautiful imaging and really excellent results but without really understanding the flow and the workflow within radiology and where their product would interface would it come with a manufacturer's offering of a scanner? Would it come in your PAC system where we all view our images? And how would it actually do that? An industry need to step into that gap to make these offerings user-friendly for all of us and available to radiologists by playing in that space. Um, so I'm really interested in, in exactly what you're just describing there about how it gets em em embedded. Is there a, is, is there a sense of... of um, people's kind of early attempts at, at doing this. I think I was speaking to um, a radiologist as part of a, a King's Fund research project um, recently about some of the kind of, um, I guess, a sounded like an app store, an AI store approach in, in, in some of the um, solutions out there. I wonder what, um, what people uh, think of, of those other alternative models 
um, uh, and, and, and how you kind of assess what, what goes in there. Erica, did you want to come back on that? I could see you nodding. Yes, if, if you don't mind, that would be great. I, I think there is a risk of this, that there are a plethora of effectively apps that really look fantastic, but you can't quite work out what you do with them and how they'd flow in what you do on a daily basis. So for most radiologists, they get into work, they log on to their RISPAC system and they pull up images to report. So the AI needs to be part of that workflow. So you either see prompts or you have your workflow stratified by AI algorithms, or you see your images pre-annotated. There are lots and lots of ways of doing this, but having 40 or 50 different suppliers of different algorithms to each radiology department just won't work. They, they look lovely, but it's not going to actually be effective in terms of delivering the kind of transformative change that Neelam and I both believe is possible from AI. So, Mark, I'm conscious that um, uh, as, as I'm not able to see you at the moment, you may well be um, uh, frantically roving at the screen to say, um, let me come in as well. So I'm just going to bring you in next and then come to you, Neelam. Uh, uh, no, 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 I'm not uh, frantically waving at you. Don't, don't worry. But I, I strongly agree about what, what, what has just been, been said by my colleagues. Um, I, I've spent most of my career involved in the introduction of digital technology to various aspects of, of, of healthcare. And the reality is that the technology typically isn't the difficult bit. Um, it's the incorporation into, into the workflow, it's the change process uh, um, associated uh, with different uh, different practices and it's doing a proper risk assessment on the training and, uh, and adoption uh, in a way that uh, allows us to build build confidence and um, there is however a really important point um, here about us taking a serious design approach to the adoption uh, of, of of technology rather than a kind of let's play with this app today type type approach um, in the same way as if my colleagues were going to introduce a piece of equipment into their hospital, they would do that in a very structured, programmed, disciplined way uh, that incorporates how it was going to be used, uh, how we were going to train people who we were going to ask to use it, and um, how we we're going to evaluate it, and how we were going to monitor the impact that it's, it's going to have. And it is the same kind of design principles and program discipline that's needed in the mature adoption of this kind of technology. Neelam, would you like to come in? Yes, um, listening to what has been said reminds me, I've been uh, hobbying around this for years now, reminds me of uh, pre-2006 where we, uh, prior to that, every modality vendor was sell selling you uh, an archive and a viewer. So a CT scanner would come with its own little uh, archive, with its own little viewer, MRI scanner would, the vendor would sell you. So, and then we came down to recognizing that we needed uh, an enterprise-wide, uh, uh, a, a storage solution and an enterprise-wide viewer, which would incorporate all the modalities and allow you to see a, 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 a unified view of the patient. So when we now look at this, we're looking at it with a different uh, viewpoint. We've got every vendor, every algorithm vendor coming with its own um, own uh, solution and saying, uh, put this in and then it'll be able to do this. What we really need is something uh, sitting as a platform, allowing the AI vendors to come in and put in the algorithms and that AI platform vendor uh, be able to uh, incorporate various algorithms and it doesn't matter to a radiologist then because if they're looking at a chest x-ray that they there could be an algorithm from one vendor to look for lung nodules and an algorithm for another vendor which is better for looking at the bones and looking for a rib fracture and uh, and that would apply for for example for the brain imaging you could have uh, an algorithm from somebody that looks for stroke and it's very good for looking for stroke whereas you have some uh, a vendor who who's very look good at looking for ms for that matter but the platform will uh, allow both algorithms to work on the images will allow a, a report to be produced by, by the platform and be available to with the uh, the markups that uh, the radiologists can toggle on and off and and be able to use it as what Erica has, has nicely described as as the first read or uh, the, the the screening by the AI and for a radiologist then to issue a personalized 
human report for uh, further management of the patient. So those are really um, interesting insights into what it takes to put these kinds of tools into workflows and into clinical workflows. And I think that's something that um, is uh, probably, you know, in all of the discussions about AI in clinical practice, I think in radiology, it's one of the areas that's that's most explored most consistently in the discussions about it. Um, so I think that's really uh, uh, heartening. And um, I think it kind of leads on to the next question, flip it around for what does it feel like for um, for those clinicians who were, who were I guess, starting out in their careers. We had a, one of the, the questions that came through was about um, whether um, radiologists should be um, becoming deep learning experts as well. Um, so I think uh, the way that we wanted to discuss that was about what it kind of what kinds of thing it takes to build these systems. We talked about that before, um, uh, but uh, I just wanted to kind of give people an opportunity to discuss that as well. Eric, would you like to come in on that? There's going to be no shortage of work for radiologists. Um, there's plenty for them to do, no matter how much of what we currently do might be augmented by artificial intelligence solutions and new algorithms. I think the way I'd look at it is that we are um, in part of a specialty that's probably the quickest moving in terms of technological change. So in both our careers, Neelam and I have seen a huge shift in what we already do. So those people who choose to do radiology, when you go in, the career you have is not what you do now in 20 years time because of those technological shifts. I think it behoves us all to understand the technology we work with. So of course, radiologists today will need a better understanding of deep learning, machine learning, and artificial intelligence algorithms certainly than I needed when I trained 30 years ago when none of those existed. And the hospital I worked in had one CT scanner and no MRI scanner. You can't imagine a world so different in radiology now. So I think it is part of what we need to train for the future. Do I think everybody needs to understand how the code works and how to actually program for AI? No, of course not. That isn't sensible. The same way I don't really understand the physics inside a CT scanner. Great, thank you. Um, Neelam, would you like to come in? Yes, I, I agree. Um, it, it's a different, either you're a clinical radiologist and you problem solve and you give an advice on how to manage a patient that is in front of you. And that's what I see my job as. I might not see the patient, but I'm, I, I give an opinion, um, uh, whether even if it's a chest x-ray report uh, with it has transformed. As Erica said, we have seen a lot of transformation. What I used to see radiologists resisting and saying, we don't want to look at that, but we are doctors. You know, we, we, we now that we have access to blood results, histopathology reports, we evaluate those before giving an opinion. And that information, the information about PCR testing. So we're, we're not just radiologists anymore. We are radiological doctors who give an opinion which an opinion that counts to the frontline doctors who can then uh, go ahead with treating the patients so that has transformed so there will be another cohort of doctors who will work with the computer scientists computer engineers to help them develop algorithms that are relevant and we need those doctors as well so there'll be two different types of doctors and they will do both provide a give a make a huge role in this society but we don't need to do what computer engineers do uh, they are much better at doing it. We, we, it's like them having cack-handed doctors trying to do a doctor's job. Let them do their job. Great. Thank you. And Mark, would you like to come in? So thank you. Obviously, completely agree with what my colleagues have, have just said. Um, what's really nice about clinical practice is the, the diverse a number of routes that you can take when you're actually in, in practice. And, and one of the significant developments uh, recently has been the emergence of clinical informatics as a, as a discipline. And in fact, we, we, we now have a faculty of, of clinical uh, informatics uh, to actually start to set the standards and provide a community of interest and to support professional development for clinicians who want to develop a, a further interest in, in informatics. And there are many uh, uh, radiologists and and imaging professionals uh, who have taken who have taken that that route. 
certainly in IBM, we've had great, the great fortune of working with um, many clinical uh, innovators, academic fellows, um, people doing PhDs. Um, and, and I have to say, radiology really excels uh, in the UK in this particular field. We have a brilliant talent pool uh, to go to in the UK. Thanks, um, actually, in, in, in part down to the leadership of colleagues that are actually on this on this call call today. Uh, and this is really important. Um, obviously, there will be a range of informatics and AI expertise across the sphere. Some who will want to get into the deep detail of the of the the programming. And, and, and the technical detail and, and others uh, perhaps like Erica for example if I can pick on Erica who who have found themselves in leadership positions needing to think about the the whole uh, design and flow of a, an Im a, a imaging service but it is absolutely critical that we don't view this kind of technology as a clever bit of kit that we can bolt into our existing workflows, but rather turn it around the other way. And we need people to take a step back and think about how we redesign workflows for clinicians and for patients, and indeed a broader system enabled by this technology. Now that's a different exam question and one that requires a different way of thinking and skill set. It's not about necessarily understanding what a five level neural network uh, might operate, uh, but does require a, a way of thinking about technology and design together to create opportunities and different ways of solving solving problems. I know I know Herika agrees with me because we have worked on this together for many, many years. And, and but it's, it, it's an important point, And I think one that we shouldn't lose sight of. Oh, I think that's a really good time to move the discussion on to uh, the adoption question and um, the scale question. Uh, some of the questions that we've got coming in on this end um, are about um, whether patients will accept an important diagnostic role for AI in radiology applications um, uh, and, and, and how these kinds of um, decisions that are supported um, as you have been describing in many different cases, uh, are then communicated to patients um, through radiologists, through other clinicians. Um, Neelam, would I be able to come to you first on this? I can. Uh, regarding adoption, before I go into patients, I'd like to talk about radiologists and how uh, we need to make sure that it's really well integrated into the radiologist workflow. Okay. Um, uh, just to uh, mention that RCR has uh, published a document on AI integration into radiologist workflow uh, around the COVID-19 uh, uh, documentation that a RCR has. We actually brought this document forward um, uh, quickly because we became aware that industry might try and get uh, AI solutions available to radiologists uh, as part of this uh, response to this pandemic. And we didn't want that it was implemented in a bad way. We wanted it implemented using standards of it integration and so that it was a level playing field for all vendors and all industry. So it, it has come in and it, it, what it, it, it uh, suggests to industry is to adopt the in, uh, global standards of DICOM and HL7 to communicate with the existing um, uh, technologies that we already use for our reporting, which is RIS and PAX. The PAX is for display, the RIS is for the workflow. So as long as the AI vendors uh, uh, do this and uh, are do this properly, and we've seen this happen uh, in the PAX adoption as well. The PAX adoption uh, became a reality because of adoption of the two standards that I mentioned, which is HL7 and uh, um, and DICOM, and it has been really, really successful. I see a big analogy in between PAX adoption, PAX and RIS, which was slightly more difficult, but both Eric and myself have been through that, but we can make it easier by having learned from the PAX adoption and make sure that the AI adoption is, is much more easier, much more um, uh, uh, smooth, and we can hugely benefit. The, the whole of the NHS with a good adoption of AI can benefit from it and so can patients. So uh, patients will, in my view, will still need a human being. They need to feel comforted that if something goes wrong, whether by an AI algorithm or by, uh, by a human being, there is somebody who's held accountable and they can go to GMC and complain about 
uh, the person who uh, who is responsible for uh, for uh, some, uh, some an untoward incident towards the patient and i think for that reason there will be a human uh, a person responsible if we go back to the covid 19 situation we do have uh, 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 samples that uh, you know the, the, the uh, tests which are not 100% accurate however uh, who's responsible for making judgments and understanding that uh, a test may not be 100% accurate it's the doctor who's looking after the patient so they they are responsible for understanding the limitations of the test uh, and therefore giving um, passing judgments and giving advice based on that understanding and that is what a radiologist will do in the future we will know the limitations of the ai work upon it and give the right uh, give the most uh, um, uh, appropriate advice based on our clinical understanding and the, the uh, and um, and uh, being responsible for our management opinions so uh, i'm I, i'm just going to kind of introduce another um point here um which is about um i guess in other specialties um they might be considering uh systems that um perhaps do an automatic referral or something like that um and where it's where it's a a, a, a very less clearly something that uh, a clinician is kind of um, taking into account in when they are making a decision as a, as a kind of support tool. Um, and in those areas, I think that uh, is that something that we, we might see in radiology? Um, and what are the kind of issues to deal with around that? Um, would Neelam, would I be able to come back to you as it kind of touches on some of the things you were talking about there? Yes, I think uh, it's again, uh, if you look at the AI vendors, when you uh, when it comes down to, uh, that's why the, uh, the FDA calls it decision support tools. A lot of the AI, which was previously hyped as being the final opinion coming from by the computer, has moved into the the uh, the middle ground, which is the decision support tool. So, i.e., it supports the decision of uh, of what a clinician would make, and that is. That is going to be hugely important for us. We all know that a tired uh, human eye can miss a lung nodule on a CT when they're going through thousands of images. But an AI algorithm is very unlikely to miss uh, a, lung, a, a tiny one millimeter no lung nodule that I might miss. So therefore, uh, I think AI is inevitable, but it will be a decision support tool. I, I don't see any vendors willing to take the medical legal responsibility. Mark, can I come to you and then come to Erica on that, if you'd like to? There's a real kind of maturity um, uh, aspect to this. Um, the reason that at Watson Health, we've, we've started with clinical review, uh, which sits um, behind uh, uh, the reporting, um, is because in many ways it's the safest way of augmenting the clinicians and the one that adds most value immediately in capturing safety safety critical um, incidents. Um, but actually, the reality is in over time, as the evidence builds, as the confidence builds, um, we as an industry will incrementally see the introduction uh, of, of this um, kind of technology into, into, into other areas, as, as we were describing earlier. Um, what, what you were talking about early, earlier is what we describe as robotic process automation. And we've seen robotic process automation are are being introduced into most other industries with very significant um, um, benefit. Um, but it's really important that we take a stepwise approach to this. We don't want to run before we can walk. And um, all we will do if we if we do that is create a great deal of, of, of hype and actually not inform uh, the debate. Um, we should start where there is most value and least, least risk. Uh, we should take a science first approach and we should incrementally build the evidence on uh, over time uh, in the way that we've just been describing. Erica, thoughts on this um, automation? Challenge? Yeah, I think I think this is really important. And, and just building on what Mark said about the hype, um, we have heard um, very senior people in the NHS say that AI will mean we do not need to train radiologists or AI means we'll need far fewer radiologists. I actually see no evidence for that. As a country, we undertake less imaging per head of population than we probably should when you look at international markers and comparative data. I think that 
artificial intelligence is a supplementary to support what we currently do and will, if I'm really honest, replace some of the more boring bits of radiology. And there is nothing probably as dull, I think Neelam may agree, as hunting for that two millimeter pulmonary nodule on literally hundreds of chest CT slices when an artificial intelligence algorithm can instantly put little red rings around them and show you where they are. Without the clinical history and the knowledge of the patient and the ability to look at all the other parameters that involve that patient, actually knowing what those pulmonary nodules mean is more significant. And that's where you need the radiologist. And the radiologist can say those little nodules might be due to a mnemonic process and infection in childhood, or they might be due to metastatic disease from a known cancer, or they might be due to current infection. And all of those things require a greater skill than any of the algorithms currently have. And we don't see the algorithms yet populating effective, useful reports for us clinically to use as part of a decision-making tool, as part of a whole pathway of care. They are supplementary to what we currently do and fantastic for that. And they will do a lot more of that. But I think that's where they sit. So um, just to bring it back to that um, initial question about the kind of patient acceptance of, of this. Is it something that is going to be going on in the background and something that's not really um, uh, perhaps uh, on their radar um, unless um, something goes wrong and, um, uh, and we explore it in that case? But um, I just wanted to bring you back to that. Do you have a kind of sense of, 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 of patients' understanding of these kinds of technologies um, and whether ultimately they will be um, heartened by them or um, uh, uh, discomforted if uh, the feeling is that um, it's, it's steering their clinicians um, uh, down paths they wouldn't otherwise have taken. Um, Neelam, can I bring you back in? Um, I think it's like I'd go back to my pre pax days. Did the patient, what was the patient acceptance of us moving from film to uh, digital? I don't think many patients realized and um and uh, and if they did realize them what most of them must have realized that we were reporting a lot faster because we realized that we were reporting a lot faster because that's what digital transformation does it does increase efficiency and that was what will happen with uh, with ai as well uh, the fact that I don't, as Erica described, I don't have to count all the lung nodules. Is, uh, 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 the computer vision would have found a lot of the things. And all I'm doing is using my what I've been trained to do uh, as a doctor, which is uh, putting things together and pr producing a, a, manage a, a judgment on tentative differential diagnosis and advice on the next step. Th therefore, the do doctor on the, uh, uh, the, the who receives my report also um, is finds it easier to put everything together. So we are all, all the time we are looking at multiple things. And if you look at what uh, we are doing now with COVID nineteen, and that's I keep coming back to COVID nineteen. I am looking at PCR tests when I'm reporting a chest X-ray. Now, somebody would ask me when I was in the film packet days and I didn't have access to packs and I did, wasn't looking on computers, I wouldn't have access to PCR or blood results. I'm looking at the CRP levels. I'm looking at, uh, could this be a bacterial infection? I'm looking at the, uh, their uh, medical letters to say, have they had any underlying health conditions? These are things we are all now looking at so much more information, and yet we are faster than the film packet days. How has this happened? This is digital transformation. That's the same that will happen with AI, but it needs to be done properly. It needs to be properly regulated. We need to know when we get, when we if, when we are looking at uh, what an output from an AI algorithm is. I'm very clear on this. I would like to know what the sensitivity and specificity of that al algorithm is. I don't want junior doctors in the front line to think this is 100% accurate. And if I am standing sitting on the fence, they they think that the radiologist is wrong. I'm going to believe the algorithm. But that is also going to be. Uh, but we need. Therefore, we need that declaration on the uh, on the screen of, of an AI output. Is that uh, this is what it is? It, there is no fracture. However, it's only ninety percent accurate. So a call for transparent and standardized um, information yeah. about 
the evidence behind some of these things there. Mark, can I bring you in next and I'll come to Erica? Um, the reality is that the public, um, which after all is, is actually all of us, um, uh, we are getting increasingly used to the application of uh, machine learning in almost all aspects of our of our lives now, whether we whether they are visible or or, 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 or whether they are embedded within uh, other bits of technology that have become uh, an important part of our everyday everyday existence. Um, I, I guess we will look to um, uh, proficient professionals and regulatory bodies to give us the confidence that these things work and are used. Uh, appropriately, but the foundation of um, public engagement in this in this space is is transparency and participation. It's involving people um, in a very open way around how the technology is deployed uh, and the trade offs and the advantages and disadvantages of it, uh, and involving them in those design uh, principles that I was describing. Um, earlier. We, we need to be mindful that first and far, foremost in a patient's mind is that they want a fast, accurate uh, result uh, and a good outcome and that quite rightly should take absolute uh, absolute priority. Uh, where there is professional confidence in the research and the evidence base then that will carry with it the vast majority of, of, of the public. Um, however, and I think this is in, important, um, the issue around public confidence is, 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 is probably less around trust in the algorithms and the AI and the technology, but more around the data and how their data uh, is being used. Um, and everything we know around the importance of control, people controlling how their data is used and transparency so they can see how their data is being used and by by, by whom um, uh, is, 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 is a critical part of um, the, the ethics and the foundation in many ways that this is, is built on. I, I think at this point we really should recognise the, the, the very good work that's coming out of NHS uh, X at the moment. They are showing uh, national leadership in the UK around ethics and transparency and the use of artificial intelligence. Um, and, and it is absolutely critical because, as I say, it's such a fundamental building block uh, towards doing this in the right way. So I would echo that. And I think um, some of the work that um, we at the Fund have done about um, public attitudes towards data use um, over the last uh, few months has really kind of um, hit, you know, work with the public um, and big deliberative events has really hit home that, um, uh, to me, how important it is to draw that link between um, data that is being used about patients um, and the benefits and the kind of tools that are eventually built. Um, uh, so the kind of transparency that Neilan was talking about before is very important there. Erica, would I be able to bring you in on this um, uh, the kind of um, paper? Yeah, so and I, I bring my medical director's perspective to this in that we involve patients in all our decision making now as a, a big acute hospital. And that includes in research governance, data governance, managing people's information. Uh, we involve patients sitting on our research governance boards, etc. So I think patients need to be at the heart of the decisions we make on their behalf. Whilst also echoing what Mark said, that we have to remember we're all patients too. We might be expert patients, experts in our own little bits of the healthcare work that we do, but we are still patients. And I think patients are much less frightened about these sort of technologies than they were historically. I don't think most patients are ready to have tests reported only by an algorithm-based system. I think most patients want to know there is a human sense check as part of their systems of healthcare. But let's face it, patients have got used to lab tests all being automated. I don't think they ever noticed the change, actually. But all of your laboratory tests um, are automated. Not your COVID-19 tests. They're all checked by a human because those are all very new to us. So we're still sense checking all of those. And there's a human final check on all the laboratory runs for COVID-19. But I think this is, this is rapidly changing and people will accept all sorts of things as long as we educate them as to the value and we make sure they're involved as appropriate in our decision making. Fantastic. So um, I think we're coming towards the end of our discussion. And I just wanted to kind of 
um, turn to this question of whether these kinds of tools will be available across the system. It's something that's come up in lots of different people's answers, but that kind of how do we spread it um, consistently? You've talked about some of the technologies that you use now um, that might that have that I understand have taken um, have been rolled out patchily in some areas, very quickly in some areas um, uh, uh, over the last few years. Is that going to be a similar story here, or are there lessons that we can learn from history there? And I'll just kind of. Uh, urge you to kind of keep it to um, uh, short, pithy statements or uh, you know reading that you can go and find out more on um, over thirty seconds. Can I just come straight back to Erica um, just to bring you in uh, first on this, please? Um, so I I think that that where we're seeing this move is uh, to a rapid transformation of our services, so that we will embrace this pretty quickly over coming years and we will work in partnership with industry colleagues so that we have an offering that's actually useful for NHS radiology departments and reporting radiologists and radiographers to use. Brilliant, thank you. Mark, can you come in next and I'll come to Neilan. It's two things. The first is, is bringing in organisations that are uh, able to scale but by design. So they have, they have architectures uh, that are able to uh, approach whole system deployments and you create mature industry partnerships with those organisations that are able not just to do small point research projects, uh, but to be able to deploy whole industry, uh, whole industry solutions. The, the second is this, this critical area around alignment, system alignment. Um, if, if you look at what's, what's happened in the successful adoption in primary care of digital capability or, or um, uh, in booking, for example, it was when we, we aligned how the system gets regulated, how money flows around the system, how we train the workforce and how we indeed organise our organisations with the technology. And it's when those things are all lined up, then you really see the adoption and kind of scale and the pace that we want to see. Really useful insights from other sectors there, Mark. Neelam, finally, you. Yes, I, I, I'm a bit of a cynic here. Uh, I think the technology has been around and I think industry has been playing its part. Um, we have been talking about the AI platforms and we have been seeing um, very uh, mature, uh, very, some very mature uh, algorithms for particularly things like brain hemorrhage and all. But are we seeing uh, their adoption into the NHS? And sadly for me, I don't see it. I see huge benefits of it, but can I have it at Doncaster and Bassett Law Hospital so that we can uh, have our images pre-triaged and um, or pre-looked at as the screening by uh, by uh, by an AI, which we I know is uh, pretty good and perhaps not hundred percent accurate, but I'm, I I know that uh, in nothing in medicine is hundred percent anyway. We always take risks on it, but can I see it? The answer is no, because we lack funding for it in the NHS. And um, and whenever we talk about it, the question is, how are we going to save money? And can we uh, can we reduce the number of the radiologists that need to report it? Can this be automated? Uh, and we've talked at length, these cannot in the first step be automated. And therefore there is no means of saving money to fund this, uh, this, these algorithms and these uh, AI platforms. So that that is where I think there is a problem: is the funding. And the other thing is is the the, uh, the vendors, the commercial vendors, not going out all on their own. They need to collaborate around standards. They need to let other, you know, the small vendors uh, have uh, be able to. Uh, play in this space and to develop really good algorithms so that they can get a, a piece of the cake from the NHS as well. Okay, thank you, Neelam. I think that's um, also served really useful, um, usefully as um, concluding remarks there, because I think it uh, shows some of the, you know, some of the challenges that still remain. I just wanted to give um, Erica and Mark the opportunity to share some um, final remarks there. Um, just uh, running a little bit short of time, which is my responsibility, so apologies for that. I'm going to come to Mark first, actually, and then Erica, if that's okay. Mark. I just want to reiterate what Neelam has just said about open, open standards. It, it's such a critical aspect 
of um, the, the, the part that we all play in addressing uh, the difficult challenges um, in, in the redesign of, of, of healthcare. And it's an area that is of particularly particular importance to, um, to IBM. You know, no single player has all the answers here. We are strongest when we come together uh, as an e in ecosystem and when we collaborate. Uh, and frankly, the currency of collaboration is the adoption, the rigorous adoption of uh, open standards uh, and interoperability. Uh, this is unbelievably important. Um, uh, if, if we could just reflect again on what NHS is doing in this space, uh, they have really driven um, uh, some uh, significant leaderships and, and, uh, and are pushing forward with the kind of scaling of prudent solutions using their AI lab that is a, 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 a attempting to achieve precisely this. We're really fortunate in the UK in having the clarity of policy, the strength of policy lead uh, support for, for in this area. And I, I, I honestly believe it's incumbent on all of us who work in uh, health technology uh, to take advantage of this opportunity. Thanks, Mark. Um, I think I agree with you. There's lots of exciting work going on behind the scenes in terms of building up the detail of what the AI lab will be and a lot of other work ongoing at NHSX. Um, Erica, could I bring you in as some final remarks? So for, for me, the work from NHSX is going to be fundamental. And um, I would also need to be assured that any products that we launch into this market are regulated as well as tried and tested. And I think, the what, as Mark has said, doing this in a collaborative way is absolutely essential for the NHS. And to make sure that we embrace it, this technology quickly, we need NHSX to guide us. Fantastic. Thank you all very much um, for taking part today. Um, I should also say that we've been recording this um, at a time that um, the novel coronavirus and COVID-19 has um, really changed the landscape of health and care and really become all-consuming um, for all three of you um, and for all of our um, uh, 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 viewers um, who will be uh, tuning into this stream. So um, we really appreciate you taking the time to um, discuss this with us and to continue these discussions and, and share this learning at uh, what's a really challenging time. So we really appreciate that for, here from uh, me and my colleagues at the fund. Um, we will be, um, as I said at the start of the show, we, uh, we, um, at the start of the stream, um, we will be um, answering questions that you ask um, during this live stream and have been asking during this live stream. Um, uh, and, and the library team and um, myself will be answering them uh, from the King's Fund over the coming days. Um, so please do um, keep uh, those questions coming in as well. Um, please do share the link to the event with colleagues who can register and watch on demand. Um, uh, and uh, I think that is absolutely everything. So I've just got to say one more special thanks to our um, uh, speakers today. Um, it's been a really interesting discussion. Uh, I hope we can continue these discussions um, uh, with some of the colleagues that have been, have been mentioned um, uh, and others over the uh, uh, coming uh, days and months. Um, but um, for now, um, from us, uh, that's everything. Thanks very much, guys. Bye-bye.